So you want to learn Lightroom Classic and you're looking for just one video that's going to show you everything from start to finish that you need to know to actually use this program, start editing photos and creating. Well, this video is that video. We're going to sit down together. I'm going to pretend like you and me are sitting down at a coffee shop. We're just hanging out, having a drink, going through things on a Saturday morning. And I'm going to show you from start to finish my process for editing inside of Lightroom, how this program works, what it's capable of, the workflows you need to know to kind of edit efficiently and get the most out of this program because there's a lot going on here. And it's not something you could just kind of digest in one 10 minute video. Get ready to sit down, learn Lightroom Classic from start to finish. You ready? Let's do it. All right, so without further ado, I'm Ryan here at Signature Edits. The goal is to teach you how to create better photos and how to create a business doing what you love. So with that said, Lightroom Classic, absolute monster of a program, capable of so much, and there's a reason that the pros use it. However, <laughs> there's a lot going on here, a lot to learn, a lot to digest. And what I wanna do today is really focus in on like, what is the 80-20 rule? What is the 20% of things that we actually need to know about this program to get great results? And then that other 20%, that's the stuff you can pick up along the way because there's so much going on in here that you're just never gonna use. Honestly, I've been using Lightroom for about 10 years now. I've edited thousands of photos. I've edited hundreds of different sessions. And there's a lot of stuff here you just don't need to worry about. And so part of what we're going to do is just show you what you don't need to focus on, show you the few really important things and get you started editing right away. Okay. So with that said, let's open up Lightroom Classic together. And if you do want to edit along, if you want to practice on some of these files, head to signatureedits.com slash free dash raw dash photos. You can download free practice raw files. And then that way, as you're learning, you can apply this stuff and you'll remember it a lot better. So all that said, open up Lightroom Classic. The first thing that's going to happen when you open Lightroom Classic, it's going to pop up with some kind of a dialog box that looks kind of like this. Create a new catalog. What is a catalog? Well, think of a catalog like a big filing cabinet with all of your photos and your files inside of it. And inside of this filing cabinet, we're going to create folders where we're going to put our different projects and sort things and organize things. But the catalog just holds everything. So we can call this, say, 2024 shoots. Or we can call it, if we want to be specific and just have weddings on this catalog, we can call it our 2024 wedding catalog, right? Typically, what I would recommend is you have one for your personal, one for your professional. And then that way it's like, okay, we've kept these things separate. They're still organized and we can just switch back and forth between the catalogs as we need to, but there's no right way to do this. And that's the thing about Lightroom. There's 10 different ways to do everything, which is why it can be kind of confusing. And it's like, Ryan, just tell me the way I should do it and I'll do it. And I'm just telling you, don't worry about this step so much in terms of like specifically how you want to do it. You'll learn this later on. So for now, just give it a name like 2024 catalog or my catalog or whatever you want. You can just call it my catalog because you're a special person and you're a snowflake. All right. So my catalog, special snowflake. Great. You're going to create that catalog. And from there, Lightroom's going to open up a blank screen with no images. And it's going to say, what do you want to do now? You're going to say, I have no idea. Um, so this is the view you're kind of going to have when you first open up Lightroom. There's two main things going on inside of Lightroom that you really need to learn. There's the library view and there's the develop view. The library view is where we organize things, where we kind of see our photos at a glance, where we've got this nice big grid. We can look at all of our photos and say, okay, we want to put this there, this there, keep this photo, get rid of that photo, organize these into this folder. All that kind of stuff happens in the library, the sorting section, kind of like in a real library, they're organizing the information so that you can access it and put it where it needs to go. The develop module, on the other hand, think about old school film. You used to take it in to get developed. And they take that and they'd use different settings and they would draw out the colors of the photos. That's what we're going to do in the develop module. That's where all the actual editing happens. We've got library and develop. And the two shortcuts you really need to know in Lightroom more than anything else is the G key and the D key on your keyboard. G is going to take you to this view. It's the grid view. D is going to take you to the develop module. So D for develop, G for grid, which is one of the views inside of the library. Now there are other keyboard shortcuts you can use in library, like the E key. And really E and G, those are the two you're going to use the very most because E takes it into what's called the loop view. Don't ask me why. It makes no sense. I don't know. We can call it the egg view. I don't care. E and G go back and forth like that. And then occasionally you're just going to want to be able to see the image a little bit larger than what's normally available in the grid view. And you might be asking, well, Ryan, the develop module also has a nice big image. Why wouldn't I just use that to see a big image instead of hitting the E key? That's a great question, friend. Well, if we hit develop, and then we try and go back and forth between our photos. Lightroom's a lot slower in this mode because it's looking at the full res raw and it's applying all of our settings. So if we do this with the E key, you're going to see you can go back and forth between your photos a lot faster that way, especially if your computer's a little older. Okay, so you've got E for this kind of view in the library module, G for the grid view, and D to get to develop. 
And I'm not going to go really in depth here on all the different keyboard shortcuts out there. I'm just going to show you the ones that are really, really important and that are going to save you a ton of time. These three, worth learning. So you might be asking, Ryan, you're kind of skipping ahead. You didn't show me how to get the photos into Lightroom. What do I do? Okay, perfect. We're going to start by hitting this import dialog and then we can navigate to where we actually want to import our photos. So you're going to see on the left here, it's got a big list of the hard drives connected to your computer and you can select which hard drive you want, find wherever the RAWs are stored and select that folder. Lightroom's gonna look and say, okay, all these photos, those are inside this folder. Which of them do you want me to import? Perfect. Well, all we have to do is just check the ones that we wanna import. There's a couple different ways to do this. One would be to check the boxes one at a time and say, I want this one and this one and this one. Another way would obviously be to just go check all. Now, the kind of more <laughs> efficient way of doing this would be to uncheck everything to start with. And then we hit the P key on our keyboard for pick. And if we hit P, in theory, is going to add that check mark to the photo that we actually like. Now, the problem is when you're in this view, the grid view, it's kind of hard to see which photo is which. Like, let's say we have two similar photos and we want to see which one we like better. Okay, hit E on your keyboard like we talked about. That will pull up kind of the larger version of the image. Now we can go through with our arrow keys left and right and select which images we want to keep from the shoot. So we just hit P every single time that we want to include it and import it into our library. And if we don't select that, well, then that photo won't be imported once we hit this import dialog, okay? So that's basically how we're going to import our photos. And this is called culling. We start off with all of the raw files that you back up onto a hard drive after a shoot. So never do this directly from the SD card because what happens is Lightroom is actually just looking at wherever the files are stored and it will reference that location. It won't move the files into this catalog, like the actual raw file itself. That stays in whatever folder or hard drive you've got plugged into your computer. And then Lightroom is just referencing that file. And so later on, if I were to unplug that hard drive, move that folder, delete those files, Lightroom would lose those files as well. So that's a really big difference between Lightroom CC, the cloud version, and Lightroom Classic, is that Lightroom Classic just references files. You have to make sure you keep them organized. So my system for organizing my shoots is pretty simple because I'm a simple guy. <laughs> I normally, with say a wedding, um, wedding hard drive, I would have all my weddings in one folder, and then for every client, every shoot, I would go ahead and I'd make a new folder. So I'd call it whatever their names are, wedding. Inside that folder, I'm going to have another folder called raws. And then I'm going to drag all the raw files in there. Then later on, once those are in there, and I open up Lightroom, and I have this import dialog box up, or I'm just sitting here in the grid view, all I have to do is just grab that folder, drag it on top of the library view, and Lightroom will automatically open up that file location find all the photos that are inside of there, and then you can select using the P tool and that E key on your keyboard to get the grid view or the loop view. And you select which ones you like, and perfect, great, you hit import, and Lightroom will import all those photos. So let's try this again. I'm gonna go over to Finder. We'll just grab some files from my desktop because why not, it's easy. <laughs> we'll click and drag those right over like that. Okay, now you can see this is all of the files on my desktop. There's way too many of them, and most of them are really confusing screenshots. But there are a few photos on here that maybe we'd want to import. So I can hit E on my keyboard, and then using my arrow keys, go back and forth. And if I like it, it's like, okay, great. I like this photo, let's pick that. I like this one, let's pick that. I go through, I select all my photos. From here, we've got two different kind of toolbars on each side, right? This one is where our files are located, which we don't need to worry about right now. And on the right here, we've got, what do we do with the files, Ryan, once we actually hit this import button? And so we've got this build previews option. Honestly, you don't need to worry about this too much. In general, you can leave it on standard. Lightroom is going to make a JPEG version of the file so that it's a little bit faster when it's editing inside of the develop module. So like, don't worry about this too much. I'm giving you the 80-20 rule. Like, in general, just leave it on standard or minimal if you want it to finish importing faster. That's it. Smart previews. If your computer is older, and you really want to like make it as efficient as possible, you can check build smart previews. Lightroom's gonna make little previews and instead of editing the original raw file, it will edit that little preview. And it'll make it a little bit faster when you're using an older computer. So in general, newer computer, leave that unchecked. Don't import suspected duplicates. Lightroom will make sure it's not importing files that have the exact same name multiple times. So that can be helpful. As far as apply during import, develop settings, you can choose if you want to have a preset on import and I, Honestly, don't do this. I like importing the file raw and adding a preset afterwards because I don't necessarily know what the preset's gonna look like until after I've seen it. So I wanna choose that and see the original file. I don't wanna have it have a preset on to begin with when potentially the preset might be making things worse instead of better. And then metadata 
is basically little things that we can actually build in. So if you want to have like your copyright added to the photo, stuff like that, you can go in and add that and make your own preset for that. And keywords. So if I wanted to, I could say weddings and I don't know, SoCal shoot, whatever. You can add keywords to the files if you want. Again, I don't bother with this because it doesn't really matter to me. But the metadata, you might want to do that. If it's for a client, you could add, you know, your photography name, co, something like that. So we have our imports selected. We hit import and Lightroom will think for about 10 seconds and voila, you'll have your images in Lightroom. Easy. Congrats. You've done it. Stage one complete. So now we have our photos. They're all sorted here. Now, how do I make sense of the rest of this panel, Ryan? <laughs> well, if I'm giving you the 80-20 rule, the truth is that at this point, you've already gone through and you've selected the photos that you want to edit. So in general, you don't have to go through and like sort them any more than you already did. You've already got them. But let's say that we want to organize the files inside of here. Well, we might want to actually have them in separate folders depending on the shoot. So let's say that I just imported a wedding and this catalog has all the weddings that I've shot this year or all the weddings I've shot ever. I would probably want to have each wedding in its own individual folder, right? So I could just access those images and keep them separate whenever I want. So that's what this left column is all about. So the first thing we have here, well, I guess the very top is the navigator, which can let us kind of zoom in, look around at the image, that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Hit G on your keyboard to get back to grid view at any point. I don't really use this in library ever. The next section is the catalog mode um, or catalog selection. So this is basically just showing you which photos Lightroom is currently displaying, whichever one is highlighted. So right now I've got it to all photographs. So all the photos in that entire catalog are being displayed. Okay. Honestly, you're not going to use that much. It's more a matter of like, where do my photos go? Just make sure that that is selected. Next, we've got folders. Folders is... Lightroom's way of displaying where the images are actually located. So you can see that I've got a bunch of folders right here. 2,500 of them are on my desktop. 63 of them are sitting in my downloads folder. And a bunch of them are sitting in this external hard drive that I've got. And so by doing this, you can go through and say, okay, show me all of the ones that are sitting on this folder in this hard drive. Really easy way to find your files. And then if you right click and go, okay, right click, show in finder, you can actually really easily pull up that window and find that exact file. So that's kind of handy. In general, you're not going to use that too much, but once in a while, you'll need it. The real part of this you are going to use is the collections window. Now, collections is basically just all of the folders that you're making to sort your filing cabinet. So pretend all your photos are inside this filing cabinet in your basement somewhere, and you want to keep them organized into each session has a folder. Or maybe you have a folder that has just cat fo photos, and a folder that has, here's all my favorite pics, and a folder that has, here's selfies that I took on the night of the full moon. You can do that with your collections. So what we do is we select photos in our grid. You can do that by clicking on them. If you hold shift and then click somewhere else, you'll select all the images in between. Or if you hold command and then click, you can just click around and select the images you want. So let's say I have those five photos. I wanna add them all to a collection and call it, I don't know, my faves from this shoot. So like fave desert pics, okay? From there, I can just go create. And if I want to select include selected photos, go create and voila. Now, if I want to, I can go through and grab, here's my favorite cat pics. Here's my favorite desert pics. And you can organize these just like that by category. Or you could go in, make sure that we've selected all photographs again so that everything's being displayed. I could go and say, okay, everything from this shoot, let's make a new collection just for this particular shoot. Right? Might be the client's name, might be something to help you remember it. Maybe the date is helpful years from now. Okay, go create. And the nice part is that you can actually have as many collections as you want, and you can have the same photo in multiple collections, which is really, really cool. So that's your way of keeping your organization system kind of the way that you want it. So there is no right way of doing this, but in general, best practices would probably be to make a new collection for every single shoot. And then that way you can really easily separate out your photos and find what you need really quickly. Or you can just scroll through all the photographs just like this and find what you need. It's up to you. That's the thing about Lightroom. There's always 10 ways to do everything. So that's the left side here. Then they have the published services. Again, I have never used this in my life. I would not worry about it. You can dig deeper if you want, but it's not important for what you need to know to start out. Okay, cool. That is the left side column. Now on the right side column, we have a histogram at the very top. A histogram is just a visual way of showing the different brightness areas of your image and like how much of this image falls in the far dark parts of the image 
versus the far lights versus the midtones. Okay. So here's your black, here's your white point. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't even know why they have it in the grid view slash in the library view, because it's just something you're very rarely going to ever need here. So you can feel free to just ignore that for now. The quick develop panel. This is actually kind of interesting because what's funny is you can do all of your main develop adjustments here in the develop module, right? But let's say that later on, we've got our shoot edited and we just want to say like these two photos, okay, they don't quite match like this one versus this one, say this one, my skin's a little bit too saturated. All right, cool. If we're in our library view, we can use the quick develop and say, okay, let's just grab our vibrance, bring that a little bit down just on this photo. So it lets you make quick adjustments without having to go all the way over to the develop module. And it can be a little bit handy because if you wanted to, let's say again, we go into our grid view by hitting G. We select all these photos and say, you know what? They're all a little bit too dark, all three of these. You can select all three and go exposure up and it will brighten all three of these just a little bit, okay? So that is what the quick develop is for, making settings just like that. You can also use it to apply presets. So I can apply a black and white preset, signature edits, vintage four. Perfect. It's applied to all three at once. And then these couple, I can add a different preset. And so you can do kind of batch preset editing as well. And of course, if you want to get full screen, you either hit E to get to the loop view, or you can just double click and it'll take you there as well. And if you really want full screen, then just hit F. Voila. And hit E again to get back to that loop view or G again to get back to the grid view. So I'm trying to repeat these shortcuts. So hopefully by the end of this, you kind of got them ingrained. So that's the purpose of the quick develop module. Next, we have keywording. I'm going to skip it. Why am I going to skip it? Because you don't need this. <laughs> if you want to, you can organize your photos by keywords. You could go through and be like, okay, all the photos that have a dolphin, we add the keyword dolphin. All the photos that have a wedding, we add the keyword wedding. Or you can do that in the collections. So it's really up to you how you want to do this and where you want to organize things. I don't use this. So I'm just going to skip by it for now. You don't need it. Metadata, you can go in and edit the individual data that is actually stored in the file itself, like in the raw file. So we can go through, we can adjust the file name. We can add some captions, copyright info, stuff like that. And then comments. Again, never used that in my life. And it says it's not even supported. So why is it there? Adobe, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so we've gone through the library module, these two columns, and then we've got the bottom and the top. So the library filter if you want to organize your photos and we want to say, okay, we want all the photos that have this attribute. Let's go up. If we go metadata, we can say we want to see all the photos taken with this particular camera. Cool. We can sort it by that. This can be really handy if you had two photographers at a shoot and you want to figure out, okay, I just want to look at Stacy's photos and not my photos. You would select whatever her camera was, or you can sort by whatever lens it was taken, or you can sort by whatever else pops up here, the date, stuff like that. So that's the purpose of that up here. Make sure it's set to none in general. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be missing photos. And then on the bottom, you've got something kind of similar. We can sort the images by capture time, added order, edit time. Like this is all pretty straightforward. There's a comparison view. So if you want to actually compare two different photos and make sure you're matching edits. So let's say that this photo right here and this photo, we wanted to compare and make sure that the edits match each other. Great. We're going to go into comparison view. And let's try this again. <laughs> Okay, go into comparison view, and we can actually grab one of these thumbnails, highlight the other, and we can compare multiple photos to Geja. Okay, this can be really useful just to make sure that your edits actually match between two different photos. Great, hit G to go back to your grid view. And then we've got some different options in here. You can play around, but again, the ones you're going to want, grid view, loop view, occasionally comparison view can be helpful. That's about it. That's all you need to know there, really. And then when it comes down to the very last thing that the library module is for, it's sorting your photos in 10 million different ways. So if you want to, you can just sort them inside of your collections and that's it. But let's say that I've got a wedding and I want to just pick the favorite images I have from that wedding. One way to do it would be to just go through and mark everything I want to with a five star. The ones that I want to say publish to my blog, go through and just add a five star to the few that I want to go on the blog. Perfect. And then if you want to down here where it says filter, I can select five stars. And then rating is equal to, and now it'll only show me photos that I've marked with five stars. You can do the same thing on your keyboard. Get rid of this for a second. If you just click it, it'll go away, by the way. So one star, click the one star again, and it goes away. 
So what I can do if I want to is just assign a different number rating to all these photos with just the numbers on my keyboard, one through five, or six, seven, eight, nine will assign colors. And so depending on how you like to organize things, whether you're visual, whether you like numbers, whether you like collections, you just got to choose what's best for you. In general, I call my photos and then I just edit everything after I've called and that's kind of my process. And then later on, if I wanted to make a favorites collection of like, here's all my favorites from this wedding. Yeah, sure. Maybe you can sort them and just say, okay, all the faves that I want to post to my blog, I post as a five. That's an easy way to do that. Okay. So hopefully this is making sense so far. If you do have questions, leave them in the comments. I'll make sure to check those out. That is basically what the library is all about. It's just organizing your photos, finding a workflow that works for you. And I am always a big fan of like, start simple, add complexity later on. So to start with, just start by culling your photos and doing a great job selecting only the photos you actually want to edit. Now this is really important because most photographers, when they're starting out, we will go through and it's like, you took 200 photos at the session and then you come in and you import 195 of them into Lightroom because they're all good. <laughs> but the truth is if you handed 195 photos to your client, that would have so much less impact having 195 average photos versus having just 20 amazing photos. So my point here is when you're selecting, just start being a little bit more picky. Only import the ones that you really want and the ones that are really impressive and really showcase the kind of work you want to attract if you're trying to do this professionally. Or if you're just passionate about this, you know, only showcase the ones that you really love and want to spend time on. That would be my advice to you. Start by getting it right before you even import the photos. And from there, you don't need to worry about the library module so much other than like, these are some things you can do inside of it. Now let's head into the fun bit and hit the develop key, which is D on our keyboard, and go over into the develop module. So I guess first, what we should do, I'm gonna select everything by hitting command A. From there, I'm gonna hit the zero key on my keyboard that will set the rating of everything to zero. So I've just zeroed everything out. And then I'm gonna hit command and click on this so that I've kind of like cleared that selection. Let's go through, let's select a few photos that we're gonna edit together. I think just to have fun, we're going to focus in on a recent trip that I did this summer with a few awesome friends out to Spirit Island in Canada, in Jasper National Park. So we're gonna just use this same method we just talked about. We're gonna mark a bunch of these with a five star and just grab a bunch of photos from the trip. Awesome, cool, looks good, great, sure. Okay, so I've grabbed maybe 10, 15 photos that should be more than enough to get us started and look through everything. Now I'm gonna hit the D key on my keyboard, but first I'm going to hit this little five star guy and it'll just show us the five star photos. Let's head into develop. All right, we got the D key, hit on our keyboard. We're in develop module. You can also just click up here. If you need a little bit more screen real estate on your computer, both in the develop module and in the grid viewer library view, you can hit these little arrow buttons and that will just hide these panels away until you hover over this area or click it again. Okay, so by doing that, we can make a little bit more room and you will find the larger screen that you're editing on, the more effective and kind of accurate your edits are normally going to be in my experience because you'll notice details you wouldn't see on a smaller screen. So that would be my advice to you if you're on a small screen, especially if you're on like a, you know, 13 inch MacBook Pro or something like that. Okay, so we've got our photo right here. Let's walk through the develop module and get started editing. This is the fun stuff. So we've got a very similar situation. We've got a top panel, which basically is for nothing. There's library, develop, but we know now that to get to the library, we hit G. To get to develop, we hit D. So we don't need to have this in here. We can just get rid of it. Then we've got two panels, one on the left, one on the right, and one on the very bottom. The very bottom is just showing us all of the photos that we've selected, and we can click around on these little thumbnails. We can make them a bit bigger if we want to, just to see what's coming next and navigate and get from photo to photo. Great. We also have this filter setting, so if we want to, we can see all the one-star photos, five-star photos, same as in the library module. So that's the bottom panel. The left panel is where you're gonna find your presets, that navigator panel that we had before. And this is more helpful when you're actually editing your images because let's say I wanna zoom in just on these two good-looking guys right here. I can just click there on the navigator panel. It'll take me right there. And I can click and drag around in the image. And the amount of zoom that you have applied to the image, you can adjust with this little guy right here and say I wanna zoom in 1600% of full resolution. Awesome, <laughs> I can do that. Or I can just toggle back and forth between 100 and 1600, and then this little navigator is gonna show me where in the image I'm looking. So that's kind of the purpose of that panel. It's actually pretty useful. Now let's zoom back out, set that to fit to screen. The next thing that's gonna be on your panel here is your presets. Now by default, Lightroom is gonna come with some different presets, and I am 
probably would suggest you just delete them right away. My experience has been, although they might be better by the time you watch this, that in general, the presets that they come with are just awful. I don't know who makes them. I don't know how they can be so bad, but they are. <laughs> but by default, it will look something like this. You have a whole bunch of presets in here. I would just delete them because honestly, I have not found anything useful. But if you have, go ahead. Let me know in the comments. Let me know what I'm missing because perhaps I'm missing something. I've just found they're not very good. You can control what presets are showing up by going to manage presets here. And anything with the check mark is what's going to show up. So I'm gonna hide all of the stock ones and just like so clean up my situation. And my advice is like, start simple. You can always make things more com complicated later. The last thing you want is like 500 presets. You have no idea what any of them do. And every single photo, you've got 500 choices and you're like, I have no idea what I should be doing right now. So that's why my preset packs, I've really narrowed things down. I'm now using one base set, one matte set and one black and white set. That's the entire thing. And each base set, it's really just like one preset. It starts off really flat. And then it's just a, a variety of different contrasts. So I can just dial in, okay, this photo probably sits somewhere around there in intensity. Great. Then it's also got a nice amount slider up here. And I can just adjust the amount of the preset, find exactly what I want. And in like a couple clicks, I've gone from here to here. And for my look, that's great. You might want something totally different, in which case go find some presets that work for you, experiment, have fun. Um, that's what this is all about. There's no like right way of editing. There's no right way to do any of this because it's creative. So what you need to do is just figure it out for yourself, experiment and you'll find something awesome. So I've got one set of base sets, one set of matte sets, which is very similar. It basically just like raises up the blacks, makes it a little bit more matte. And then I've got one black and white set. That's my entire look. And the reason I've made it like this is because I wanna spend less time like tweaking and more time creating and doing the fun stuff. And I also wanna give a consistent result and experience to my clients. So I want my look to be the same from shoot to shoot to shoot, both for my clients and for me. It's going to save a lot of time versus starting from scratch every single time and going in here and like setting the settings to auto. There is this auto button up here that will like, Lightroom will do a, a good job of guessing where it should be. But the problem when you do that route, if I just reset, set this to auto, reset, set this to auto, is that you're gonna find like every photo is gonna be slightly different in terms of the edit and it's just not gonna blend quite as well. So like it's done a decent job here. And if you like that setting and you like that look, good for you, rock it. Um, but what I'd encourage you to do eventually is to create some presets of your own. So how do we do that? Well, we go to the plus icon here and instead of hitting manage presets or import presets, which by the way, if you wanted to import, you just select the preset pack, go import, Lightroom will take care of it, life is good. But if you wanna create a preset, let's say that we edit this, like, oh, Lightroom, you just nailed it, auto, first try, that looks perfect. <laughs> we go up here, we go create preset. Lightroom's gonna say, sweet, of all the settings that you've got over here, which of these do you wanna save so that next time you click this preset button, we're just gonna auto apply those preset settings and apply it to your next photo, what do you want? So we can select which of these we want. And in general, the ones that you want when you're making a preset is everything except for white balance and exposure, transform, and masking if that were currently ungrayed out. <laughs> And the reason is those are the things that change from image to image. The white balance is always going to be different. The exposure is always going to be different. And your lens transform, which is, we'll get into that and explain it in a little bit. That's always going to be like a image by image basis. So let's say we uncheck all those. We can go in here and call it my first preset. That is awesome because my mom says so. Sweet. Create a new folder called my awesome presets. My mom says so or you can save it to your user presets. So we'll just save it there, go create, and voila, I've got like 9,000 presets in here. Um, but it's gonna show up right in your user presets folder. That's how you create presets, very easy. So that's what we got here. We can select our presets. Typically for me, I try and keep it really basic. So I've got like my base sets, sweet, love that, get the white balance right. And then I'll go through, and let's say that I wanna add like a little bit more depth to the image. you can go through and actually adjust. Like, okay, I wanna deepen the background. Click that, I've got a preset that'll do that for me instead of having to manually do it. Then I can just apply the amount right here on this slider. So that is what my editing process looks like. Is that the only way to edit or the best way to edit? No, of course not. There's a million different ways. That's just my workflow. When I'm editing hundreds or thousands of images, I need it to be like this. I can't be spending an hour on each photo. It has to be efficient. So that's what I do, but let me walk you through the rest. That's your presets. Next, we have snapshots. Snapshots. I would ignore, <laughs> and I'd ignore it for one simple reason. You have this beautiful history tab here on the next tool down. And this history tab shows you literally every stage of your edit 
all the way from when you first imported the photo to every single adjustment you've made along the way. So at any point, we can go in here and grab any step and go back like, oh, my photo looks kind of worse than it did five minutes ago. Let's just go back. Easy. That's what you do with the history tab. Snapshots kind of lets you save different versions of edits. I just find it's really not worth bothering with when you have the history tab right there. And the last thing you have down here is your collections panel, which if you want, you can create a new collection, add things to collections, blah, blah, blah. But in general, you're going to do this in the library module. It's just a lot easier, more intuitive. So I wouldn't worry about that. So that is the entire left panel. Congrats. You did it. Okay. By the way, helpful video so far, hit that thumbs up button and leave me a comment below. And if you do want to support the channel, you can do that by buying a preset pack. I'll make sure to leave links as well. Check those out at signaturedits.com. Even if you don't love presets, that's how you can say thank you. But don't worry about it. We're here to hang out. Let's keep going. On the right hand side, <laughs> we've got this other bar right here. And this is where all the fun magic happens. This is where the creative stuff goes. This is all your editing settings to develop your photo. Sweet. Let's go through one step at a time. We'll reset the photo. At the very top of this whole thing, we've got our histogram, which is showing a visual representation of the image. So on the far right, we have our whites. On the far left, we have our blacks. And I'm doing this really quickly because this isn't something you really need to know or like spend a ton of time learning. Why? Because although it's a useful tool sometimes, it's not absolutely integral to like editing and creating great images. But one little fact for you, we've got these tiny little boxes here. And these boxes allow you when they're highlighted, to see parts of the image that are clipping. Now, what is clipping? Clipping is when your blacks are being cut off and you're losing information, or your whites are like pure white, and you're doing this, hold on, <laughs> doing this, and things are pure white, you're losing information. Clipping is that. <laughs> and these little boxes, when they're highlighted, will show you when things are being clipped one way or another, okay? So the blue represents pure black, the red represents pure white, and we can turn that on and off with the J key on our keyboard. So that is one little handy thing hidden in this tool up here. Another thing is you can actually adjust these different sliders by clicking on part of the histogram and being like, okay, whatever this blob is, I want to make that brighter. So I'll click and drag it to the right. Whatever this blob is, I want to make it less bright. So we'll click and drag it to the left. And by doing that, you'll adjust these sliders as well. Sometimes that's helpful. You can play around. All right. The next thing down, it'll show us our camera information, the lens it was shot on, ISO that it was shot on, aperture. This is just interesting, not really super necessary for editing. You can also access this information, I think, by hitting, yeah, the I key on your keyboard. It'll do that as well. Again, not super important, but if you want to remember that, you can. <laughs> what are all these little things up here? These are different quick access tools that we'll get into in a little bit. But the main thing we want to go through is just like the basic editing of photos. We'll start there. And in general, Lightroom lays things out from like big changes. Think really big brush when you're painting a picture. And then it gets finer and finer and finer to like the little bitty details we want to adjust. So in general, you start up top with the bigger brush adjustments. And then we get things more and more refined as we go. So first, the main thing when it comes to editing our photo, the most important thing is the white balance, the tint, and the exposure. That's why they're at the very top. So first off, we're going to get our exposure kind of dialed in, brighten things up a little bit. It's sort of dark. Okay, that looks a little bit better. Next, we'll adjust our temperature. So we can make the image a little bit warmer because it looks slightly too blue and maybe a little bit green, so we'll add some magenta. Okay, somewhere around there. Now, if at any point you want to see your image before and after, you can hit the backslash key on your keyboard. So that'll do that before and after, and you see this little before box pops up. That's really great, but sometimes I find it doesn't work. It'll show you like a step of the edit instead of the beginning, like raw file. So we can also just hit the reset button and then hit Command Z or Control Z on your keyboard and then hit Shift Command Z to reset it again. And like, that's kind of how I go back and forth a lot of times is just with the reset button. Again, you can do either. Lightroom has multiple options, but I find that's more reliable for me. So do what you want. Okay, so that's the main thing. You can also adjust your exposure with the plus and minus keys on your keyboard. So like of all the shortcuts I use in Lightroom, the D key for develop, the G key for grid view, and plus and minus in develop to adjust your exposure, that's going to save you the most time out of everything. So remember those. If you hold shift while you're doing that, you'll make bigger exposure adjustments. And sometimes going back and forth like this is a great way to be like, okay, let's find the happy medium. It feels probably the best right there. Whereas if I had just been clicking and dragging this by myself, I wouldn't know where to stop. So sometimes that's actually helpful. Okay. So that's how we can adjust our exposure. That looks pretty good to me. Next, we've got our contrast, highlight, shadows. I feel like this is stuff you can probably figure out for yourself. I don't need to explain what contrast is, what shadows is, blah, 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 blah. But um, if you do want to know more about that, I do have smaller videos elsewhere on the channel. You can check those out or you can leave them in the comments and I'll cover them in a future video. But in general, my process for going through here is just going to be 
dialing things in and getting things kind of like corrected first and then adding style. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, first we fix what's broken. Then we worry about adding stuff on top. It's like if we're renoing a house, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to like patch the holes in the wall (laughs) before we paint the wall. So what we'll do is say, okay, of course, it seems like I've frozen my computer. There we go. Reset this entire image. Get our white balance dialed in. Exposure up a little bit. I'm going to take my contrast down because we've got a lot of contrast in this scene. This scene is very, very bright. We'll take our contrast down. That'll brighten up the midtones and the shadows. And then I'll take my highlights down because that sky is just too bright. Okay. I'm going to take my shadows down just a little. And potentially, if I hit the J key on my keyboard, I can take my blacks down until I start to see this little bit of blue. That means I don't really want to take it any further because I'll lose information. But taking it to that point, I can kind of max out the dynamic range of the photo. And same thing with the whites. If I want to, I can take this up until I just get just before red. And now, if I were to actually reset. Here's before and here's after. We've maintained the sky. We haven't lost the texture and the information there. We've also added a little bit of punch while brightening things up overall. So it doesn't look stylistic. It doesn't look beautiful, but it does kind of have some detail recovered at this point. And now we can add more style later. So that's this panel up here. At any point, any section in Lightroom, if you hold down the option key or the alt key on your keyboard, it'll toggle between different settings and things that you can adjust that are normally hidden. So alt or option on your keyboard will let you reset any panel in all of Lightroom. So just hold it, hit reset, you can go back to zero and see what it's like with and without. You can also, in these different sections, just hit the eyeball and hold it and it'll show you before and after. So if I adjust my tone curve like this, before and after, yeah, that's an improvement. Okay, so with that in mind, I'll hold down option and reset this tone curve. And next we have the presence section. Now texture, clarity, dehaze, those are all just kind of different versions of sharpening and adding detail to our image. Now, what is sharpening? (laughs) That's an interesting one. So technically, if I zoom in here, like way, way in, sharpening, contrast, they're kind of the same thing. Contrast is just the difference between the brightest part and the lightest part in an image, right? And so what we do when we want to enhance an image and add more detail and texture and sharpening is we just take the darkest parts and we make them darker and the brightest parts, we make them brighter. So if I grab my clarity slider, you're going to see, look at this line of my toque. The blacks are very black, and right beside it, the light parts are much lighter than if I take my contrast, my clarity, down. And now things are kind of, the blacks are more gray, the brights are more gray, and things are less clear, okay? Texture is like a fine version of that, so more fine detail. Clarity is like more obvious. If I zoom in, here's the clarity, much more obvious. Here's the texture, finer detail. And dehaze is kind of the most obvious at all, I get obvious of all, <laughs> I suppose. So you can blend these together. You can get different effects. Oftentimes, I don't really increase clarity unless I really need it. Most of the time, I'm actually taking clarity down because it'll feel more dreamlike, right? Look at how the, the distance looks kind of soft and just otherworldly. And then we can take our texture up, maybe add a little bit of dehaze for some punch. And voila, we've gone from here to here in our image. So you can play around. There's no perfect setting here. This is just what these do really quick. Vibrance is going to raise the saturation of all the colors, but it's going to do so less on skin tones. So the goal of vibrance, unlike saturation, which makes everything more colorful, vibrance is trying to do the greens, the blues, everything except for skin is trying to make more poppin' before the skin. So it's like trying to preserve skin. Whereas saturation, your saturation at 100, here's vibrance at 100. See how the skin tones aren't increased as much? That's the difference. Okay, so that's the main panel up here. Most of what you need to know is in that main panel. I did skip one little thing, which is this tiny little top section. We've got auto, the ability to add an auto adjustment. Okay, you can do that if you want. Black and white, which will switch it to black and white. (laughs) This is going to be controversial, um, but normally I actually like to just take my saturation down. I find I have more control that way than hitting black and white but you can do what you want to do. I don't really care. I don't like black and white that much anyways. And then HDR, if you've got a really high dynamic range photo, Lightroom can walk you through this and kind of adjusting and trying to accommodate for that. Cool. So let's just reset this image. The last thing that we didn't talk about is the profile. Now, if you're shooting on a raw file camera and you have a different camera setting selected like standard or portrait or landscape, you can actually access these here. So if we go into our profile, click browse. You can go through and say, okay, camera matching. Here's all the different camera profiles that I could have been shooting in when I was shooting in RAW, which is super cool. So you can play around with there, see what you like the most. Or if you have preset packs that come with custom profiles, kind of like the signature edits one, here's my go-to profile. Of course, it doesn't look good with the (laughs) auto settings. 
Um, but I've done this and I've baked in, this is how I want you to interpret my colors Lightroom. And it'll definitely save you a lot of time and energy if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Creating your own profiles is kind of complicated. So we're not gonna get into that here. Just know that great presets oftentimes will have a custom profile built in in addition to the other settings that they've saved. All right, so let's keep on moving. Here's tone curves. I have a full video on tone curves. So I'm not gonna show you in depth, in depth, but 80-20 rule, 90% of what you're gonna do or 80% of what you're gonna do in tone curves is gonna be in these two tools. Not in the red, the green, and the blue. Those are like individual color channels that you can use to like really quickly make your photos seem absolutely ridiculous. Um, they can be helpful, but most of the time you don't need them. <laughs> Just straight up, you do not. But if you understand how to use these two, it's gonna be very, very helpful for you. So I'd encourage you, watch my full tone curve video. But essentially what we wanna do is we wanna add contrast to our image or take it away. Well, we can do that in the tone curve by selecting different areas of the image and adjusting the brightness up or down. So if we grab this little tool here, this little dropper, click on it, you can grab any part of the image. Let's say we wanna make the skin a little bit darker. So I'm gonna grab some skin right here, click, drag down and you can see the tone curve is added a point right here and drag that down. Now I can grab something in the image that's too dark. Say, okay, her hair is too dark. All right, click and drag it up. Now, as I'm doing that, you don't wanna take it too far. It's very easy to mess things up. But if we go just a little bit, look at before and after, right? So we can grab different parts of our image and just really quickly adjust them and play around. That's the easiest way to kind of get the hang of this thing or just watch the full length tutorial. But most of what you're gonna be doing is just in these two, which are basically the same thing. The only difference with the one on the far left is it's kind of like tone curve on easy mode. So you can actually adjust just your highlights, your darks, your shadows, and Lightroom will take care of the tone curve for you. Whereas this one, you have to do it manually. So at any point, hold down option on your keyboard. You can reset the tool and you can restart. Now, one other thing that is interesting about the tone curve versus using just this main panel up here is you can be really specific. Like, do I wanna raise the shadows? Yeah, that's all I can do with this slider. But if I wanna raise a specific area of the shadows more than others, that I can really target with this tone curve and be like, okay, right in this zone, that's where I want to affect. So that's exactly where I'm going to start by raising up. And then this area of the highlights, that's exactly what I want to pull down. So I'll grab that area right there. So that's how the tone curve can sometimes be better than your overall exposure adjustments and contrast adjustments. However, Lightroom has 10 different ways to do everything. So it's not about using every single tool for every single image. It's like, what's right for this image? What's right for me? Uh, what do I need to do here? And that's why Lightroom starts with like the easy adjustments, because if you can get it done up here, instead of fiddling around with the tone curve, it's going to be easier for you. All right. So that's the tone curve. And one interesting thing we can do if we right click, we can actually copy channel settings. And so if you wanted to, you had a preset that you wanted to apply across all of these color profiles. We could copy it and paste it and paste it and paste it. Okay. So now I've reset this white part and I've got identical curves on all of the color channels. And now I can go in here and be like, okay, sweet. Now I just wanna add a little bit more blue to all of the shadows. And I wanna take some blue out of all of the highlights and just make the skin like more yellow. So you can play around with that. But again, we're gonna get into that in the color grading section. Most of the time, the tone curve, this is just like too much work, not really worth it. <laughs> Stick to these two channels and you got most of what you need to get done, done. All right, so we've edited our photos. We've gone through, we've adjusted like the basic adjustments here. So let's go in. Love this beautiful shot. Reset. This is the image as it was. Okay, it looks a little bit blue. Ah, oh, this looks pretty good. We can maybe add a little bit of magenta. Exposure looks pretty good. Shadows up maybe just a bit. Okay, something like that. Maybe a little bit of texture, bring the clarity down just slightly. Okay, now how do we add that kind of secret sauce, that style to the image? We've adjusted some things, but how do we actually like paint the walls now that we've filled up the holes? <laughs> That's where your color mixer comes in. So we're gonna go to the mixer panel and it has three different sections, the hue, the saturation, and the luminance. Hue is kind of the tone of the overall color. So we've got access to all these different colors here. So let's focus on the blues of the lakes and the sky at the moment. I'm gonna grab the blue channel. I'm gonna grab it and take it up to the right it's going to shift it more towards its neighboring color, purple. Now, if I take it, grab it, take it down to the left, it's gonna shift it to its neighboring channel, aqua. 
So that's how we can control our colors and add style to our images. So if I, for instance, make the blue like really unrealistic and then I grab my yellows, do the same thing, and my oranges do the same thing, we can add some stylized looks to our image just like this. And of course, we have to be careful that we don't take things too far because as a new photographer or a new editor, your gut instinct is gonna be taking everything way too far. I can promise you from experience. But if we're subtle about this and we actually like dial it in and we say, okay, I'm gonna take it to where I think it looks good and then I'll dial it back by like 50%, we can add some really nice mood to our images. So here's before and here's after. Now it's kind of something cool and creative and different. If you want that, to save this and you love the look of it, just go up here and go create preset. And we can select everything and copy all of it, or we can just go check none. Go up here where it says color mixer and just save that and call it like cool teal sky look, right? And to save that in the user presets. And then if we go over to this photo right here, maybe we can go into our user presets and cool teal sky look, bam, one click. All right, so that's how we style with hue. Now saturation, very similar. We select whatever color we want to adjust. So let's go back to our sky and say, okay, I'm gonna take the saturation down. I find that like icy blues tend to look really, really awesome. So most of the time that comes from bringing your saturation down. And this is where you're really gonna have to like learn this over time is that different color combinations are necessary to get things to feel right. And by that, I mean, it's not a matter of just having the right hue or just the right luminance or just the right saturation. It's like you have to get all three right or your eye will be like, something's off here and I don't know what. And most of the time, the reason is because you've got one of these out of balance. So let's say that our saturation was just way too high. It doesn't matter what I set the hue to, everything is gonna feel kind of off. Like that feels kind of interesting, but the saturation is just too high. And until I get it in the right zone, it's not gonna feel right. And same with the luminance. So we can actually take our luminance, get a much deeper blue, but now we may need to make sure that our saturation is sitting where it needs to sit, right? So it's about finding the right balance in all of those things and not taking things too, too far. So take it where it looks good to your eye, let's say here, and then dial it back 50%. Great rule of thumb when you're starting up. So here's before and here's after. Like this is the most powerful tool in Lightroom when it comes to like adding that cool stylistic effect. So finding the right combination. How do we find the right combination? A lot of it's just experience and playing around. Let me give you a couple tips when it comes to skin, when it comes to people, when it comes to water. Most of the time, most of your effort should be spent kind of in the oranges, the yellows. If the sky or lake is a big part of the image, then the blues and aquas. If it's not, it's most of the time gonna be yellows and greens. So most of the time, you're not gonna worry too much about purple or magenta. The times you will is if you've just got like some weird magenta showing up from a light inside somewhere and you just need to take the saturation down most of the time. <laughs> but in general, skin lives in orange, yellow, and red. And it doesn't matter what ethnicity the person is, 90% of the time, that's where it lands. So we can go in here, we can adjust the skin just a little bit towards red. Oftentimes, that's the way you'll go. Saturation, most of the time, I like to take saturation of skin down a little bit. But let's say we wanna add more color to skin. Here's a little trick for you to kind of get you ahead. If you take the saturation up too far, it just looks ridiculous, right? But if we take our luminance down, that's a different way to actually add saturation to skin. It'll feel oftentimes more natural than if we try and pump the saturation. Why? Well, if skin is too bright, let's say the skin is way up here, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Once we get to white, it doesn't matter how saturated white is, it's still white. I hope that makes sense. There's no color in the color white, it's just white. So the brighter something is, the less saturation it has by itself. The same goes for black. The darker something is, Black is just pure black. There is no color in black. So where color is the deepest and the richest is kind of in that middle area. So if we take our skin closer towards the middle area, that's where we're gonna get the deepest, richest color. And the same thing applies to any color inside of Lightroom. So let's back this off because I do not like the way the color's looking. <laughs> but we can grab her jacket, let's say, and we wanna get a really deep, rich color. Well, first, let's use this little dropper tool. Click on the jacket and we can see exactly where Lightroom thinks it's living, which is in the green panel. Makes sense. Let's grab our green channel, bring it up. That looks ridiculous. However, if we were to take this jacket and say, okay, it's probably closer to white than it is to black. So we could darken it down a little bit. And as we do that, the color, without even adjusting the saturation, is gonna feel more saturated. There's gonna be more color intensity to it. And now we can grab our saturation, increase it a little bit. And we've added quite a bit of pop and color to that jacket without it feeling ridiculous, right? And of course, if we want to, we can go in, adjust the hue to what feels right for the image. But generally, if you're, doing work for clients, the hue is something you have to be really careful with, especially if it's a clothing brand, something like that. They don't want unnatural clothing colors <laughs> that aren't indicative of what the colors are actually supposed to be. So a little fun fact for you, that is kind of where the HSL panel is at and what you need to know about that. 
and it rhymed like a cat in a hat. So point color. <laughs> There's one little section here in Color Mixer you're probably wondering about. What is point color? What's it for? How does it work? Well, in the Color Mixer tool, the problem is, let's say we want to grab the skin. We can go in here. We can grab the skin luminance, and we can bring it up or down. But we can only bring it up or down a certain amount. We can't take it all the way to white. We can't take it all the way to black. We're kind of limited. Point color fixes that. The same thing goes with our saturation, our hue. We are sort of like limited to what we can do. Point color lets us grab a specific color. And then we can push this as far as we want to push that particular color. And we can even find like a specific range and be really, really accurate about what color we want to adjust. So let me grab another photo that's going to make more sense. Let's say this one right here. So if I were to go in this photo and use my normal color mixer and say I want to adjust the backpack. Okay, so I want to adjust the hue of the backpack. Notice how it's affecting his jacket, affecting his toque, affecting his skin, everything, because it's all kind of in that same color range. Okay, well, if I go into point color and I grab just this backpack like that, then if I go visualize range, I can see exactly what I selected. And it's kind of the beanie a little bit, a little bit of the jacket, but mostly it's a much more pure selection where now I can just adjust the backpack without adjusting everything else as much. And if you want to, you can kind of dial in the range so you're really only affecting a specific color. Instead of all of the oranges, you're specific, specifically selecting one shade of orange. So that's color mixer. All right, we've gone through all of that. We've got our image where we want it to get. So if you're like me, <laughs> you start off with a preset, you get your white balance and your exposure dialed in. And this is what's really crazy. And a good thing I showed you this image. See how crazy the difference is of just getting your white balance right? You can have the best preset in the world, but if your white balance and your exposure aren't set where they need to be, the preset is going to look awful. <laughs> so get that set up. You should get most of the way there. Now, in this case, the white balance is technically close to right, I think. However, because it's a cold day, because it's snowing outside, I actually wouldn't mind it being almost a little bit on the cool side, a little bit less accurate, maybe, so that we get some of that winter cold in the photo. Just like if it were a sunset photo, I might go a little bit warmer because it's supposed to feel warm. It's a sunset photo. So you don't always have to get this exactly right. And let's talk about the eyedropper tool because I'm now realizing I missed it. Technically, you can use this eyedropper, find something that's gray in the photo or supposed to be gray, and then Lightroom will automatically do its best job to guess the white balance for you. I find this is really mixed results, especially because most of the time people will be like, oh yeah, I'll do it on the teeth or the eyes. And the thing about teeth and eyes is they're not actually white. <laughs> most of the time teeth are kind of yellow, so your photo will be too blue if you select the teeth. And eyes just tend to be like red, blue, all sorts of things that just aren't the right color. So that's why I'd advise just kind of avoid that. Use your eyes. You can always set it to auto or as shot, see what works the best and go from there. But it's a skill to kind of refine that. And one way that you can work with this is to find a demo image or a comparison image and compare it to that image or just reset the photo, see where you started and see if it's actually getting better or worse. <laughs> okay, so we got our photo where we need it to get. Now we want to add some style. We want to add some flair. We've kind of adjusted our color mixer. We got some settings in there the way that we like it. Awesome, but we want to add a little bit of extra something, right? Color mixing is about adjusting what's already there. Color grading is about adding color to our image. So if I go to this little view right here, we've got three different views. We've got all three panels, midtones, shadows, and highlights. Then we've got just each on their own. And then we've got global, which it kind of lets us do an overall white balance or tint to the image. Okay. So let's say I want to add some coolness to the entire image. I can do that with my global panel. Go in here to my overall panel, and I can adjust and add color to each individual range of this image. Okay, this is way too far. Let's undo that. <laughs> take it where you like it, Ryan, then take it back 50%. Take my own advice. So let's start with our midtones because that's where our skin is living. We want to maybe add some more orange and warmth to this midtone section. So let's go in here, set it to orange. So you can grab the color and set it wherever you want. Let's set it to orange-ish. And then let's grab the amount of color we want to add and just dial it back so it's very subtle. Now let's go to the shadows. I'm going to set my shadows to like a nice steely blue. That's the goal. So somewhere around there, I think, is not too bad. And then adjust the saturation by grabbing this little guy right on this line. 100% saturation, 0% saturation. So how much color do we want to add? Let's do something around there. And then you can also adjust the overall exposure of that zone as well. If you already weren't happy with doing it elsewhere in Lightroom, you can do it again here. So we can bring our shadows down just like that. And then highlights, sure, let's add a little bit more coolness to the snow in the sky, just like that. All right, here's our color grading before and after. 
So now we've added a ton of color and mood to this photo with just a couple really simple adjustments. And again, you can save that as a preset. Go in here, go create preset. Check none. This time we're just going to select color grading and we could call it winter cold, right? Or give it a name that actually makes sense. So like orange mids, blue shadows, and highlights. Voila. You've got a preset now. You can apply to all your photos. So that's color grading. We're getting really close to the end of this develop module, which is great. So the next thing we have is our sharpening. Now I have this baked into a preset so that every single time it's just applied for me and I don't think about it or adjust it. But if you want to, you can look at these settings and see what you like. You can even pause this video and copy my settings. I don't care. Um, these are my default settings and I find they work for me. So let's go through. First is the amount of sharpening. Self-explanatory. Next is the radius of the sharpening. And this is basically like what style of sharpening is doing. Is it sharpening like in a large way or is it sharpening in like a really fine detailed way? Detail is just how much detail it's going to pre attempt to preserve and kind of bring out. And masking is the most important part here. If we hold alt or option on our keyboard, then we drag this slider up or down. By default, when masking is zero, see how it's all white? That means that everything in this image is being sharpened. Now, as I drag this up, you're going to see anything black is no longer being sharpened. So only what's white is being sharpened. And I can drag this up, 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 up. So it's only grabbing like the major lines in this photo and not sharpening everything. Because there's no point in sharpening, say, this background that is out of focus. That would just be silly and would really not do much for us. But if we have it set so it's only sharpening the things that need sharpening, it's going to be much more effective. And we can add more sharpening and get away with it without it looking over sharpened. So here's before and here's after. See how the background really isn't being sharpened too much? Of course, I've got noise reduction on as well. <laughs> so I would have to shut this off first. There we go. So here's before and after. So we're sharpening him, but we're not sharpening the background. That's why masking, the most important thing, if you are going to tweak anything from photo to photo, do the masking and hold alt or option and just drag that slider. But by default, I find sitting it around here typically works great for most photos. So that's sharpening. Noise reduction is just getting rid of the noise in the photo if it was taken at ISO 800 or 3200 or 6400. Let's zoom in. This is noise, the fact that this isn't perfectly clear. Of course, I think I have some grain in here as well, but <laughs> some of that's noise. And as I take my luminance noise reduction up, Lightroom's gonna go through and be like, okay, all of that gross graininess, let's get rid of it. The problem is that comes at a cost. You're also going to have weird colory splotchiness and just lose detail overall. So see before and after the effect of luminance, noise reduction. It can be kind of nice on the skin to have a little bit, but go too far, it's gonna feel really, really weird. So again, I wouldn't worry too much about this 80-20 rule. Somewhere around these settings, pretty good for most photos. But yeah, you can play around here. And again, there are similar settings here where if you hold down, alter option, you can get different views that can help you dial this in a little bit more. In general, leave noise reduction off or just very low. And then as you need it, then you can add it. Okay, lens corrections. What are lens corrections? Well, lenses by default aren't perfect. They'll have like a little bit of distortion because the glass is not perfectly aligned, blah, 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 blah. I don't even know the physics of it. All I know is that a wide angle lens will have more distortion <laughs> than a telephoto lens, but they all have some imperfections. And that's what lens corrections is meant to fix is the imperfections, both in the distortion of the image, the angle of the image. If you're taking it up or down, you're gonna be skewing your perspective. We can fix some of that in lens corrections. So if we go enable, we can actually select exactly what camera lens body we have. I personally leave this off 99% of the time. Only if an image really looks bad and needs fixing will I go in and turn this on. Why? Because overall, I find Lightroom just doesn't do a very good job. <laughs> and most of the time, it's going to add brightness around the corners of the image, which technically might be right. But I find because most of the time, what I am focusing on is not on the corners of the image. I don't want that area brightened. I actually like it being a little bit darker, having a natural vignette. So most of the time I leave that off unless I need to fix something, then I try turning it on. You can also manually add different corrections. So we can correct the distortion of the lens, defringe, which is like, see this? There's like a purple line kind of on the details of what's going on here. That's kind of what defringe is. It's gonna target coloring like that. So if we go in here, Lightroom might not even pick it out because it's so subtle. Yeah, so it's not finding enough because there's not enough there, but that's what defringe would do. You're gonna see as I drag that up, Lightroom will go in and be like, okay, we're gonna desaturate anything that falls in that color range and it can be helpful in some situations. But just like everything in Lightroom, if you don't need it, don't worry about it because you might just wind up making your photo much worse. So I'm gonna shut that off and reset it. Holding alter option, 
Reset defringe. Okay. Now, what is transform? Let's try and find a photo that this is really going to make sense. <clears throat> okay, let's say that this photo were taken at a slight angle up or down and the lines in the photo just aren't really straight. This one's not so bad. We just need to recrop it for it to be straight. You can do that with the R tool, by the way, or this little button right there. Then you can click, drag, correct your crop. That's not what transform is. Transform is for adjusting perspective. So let's say that I wasn't super straight onto something and it's skewed. Well, I can actually adjust the image so that I can rotate the perspective. I can do that side to side. I can do that vertically. I can rotate it just like I would with crop. I can even adjust the aspect ratio to squeeze things together or pull them apart. And you can see how this could actually be helpful for certain images. You've got someone who's a little shorter or a little heavier. You can take your aspect ratio, squeeze things just a little bit. Now, both of them look a lot taller. <laughs> and I didn't actually do anything um, other than like one little slider. So here's before and here's after. And in this particular image, you're not necessarily going to notice that I did that. So I can get away with doing like a little bit of it and just making them feel a little bit taller, a little bit more slender. It's just slightly more visually, just works better, right? Um, so we can use it to fix things, or sometimes you can use it stylistically. So again, you can use vertical to do the same kind of thing and stretch people out. Obviously, you can't do that and get away with it, but you could probably go to around here, and here's before, and here's after, right? So it all depends on the photo. Most of the time, you're using this to correct things. Sometimes you can use it stylistically, Again, horizontal, maybe depending on which way you do this, it's more flattering to whatever you're taking a photo of. Or if you have text and it wasn't perfectly aligned, that's what this would be for, is transform. Now, one way that you can do that, this that is really easy is you can just go to guided transform and you're gonna find something that should be straight in the photo. So say this window should be perfectly straight up and down in the photo. You make that line just like that. And then we find another line that should be perfectly straight. Say this window, how it intersects this way. And Lightroom will just automatically correct for that. This isn't a great example because it doesn't need correcting, <laughs> but it's going to then make those two lines perfectly straight up and down and correct the perspective for you. So that is transform in a nutshell. Pretty easy, right? And last couple of ones we got in here, we've got lens blur. This is something I don't personally mess around with because why bother? I have <laughs> great gear, great lenses, but if you do want to add some blur to the background of your photo, you can. I personally have presets built into this. So like my AI engine toolkit, I'll just be like, okay, background creamy. And then it'll auto go in there, select, and I can just be like, sweet. I want just a little bit of cream, please. Or if I want to make it dreamy. I've got another setting for making it dreamy. Um, but if you want to, you can play around with lens blur. That's an option too. Let's reset. Adjust our exposure up with our plus and minus keys. Two more main panels in the develop module. And then we're pretty much done and moving on to local adjustments. And then that's basically Lightroom. I'm super excited to get there with you. So effects. This is pretty straightforward. Crop, sorry, vignette. <laughs> we can apply some extra brightness on the corners or some darkness. You can adjust the midpoint, adjust the roundness. Like, I don't need to go into something that is pretty straightforward for you to just play around and figure out for yourself. So I won't. But we can add grain. Now, how do you actually dial in the right amount of grain? I can't give you a specific setting because if you just copied this and said, I'm going to go with Ryan's setting, it all depends on the photo. So the size of the grain, the size setting that you need to use, is going to depend on the size of the pixels of that photo. So I've had some presets were great on one camera and not on another because the actual photo size was 20 megapixels moving to 50 megapixels and then the grain got way too small or way too large. So what you want to do as a general rule of thumb, a little trick that somebody showed me, Zoom in, not that far, <laughs> on a portrait. This is for portraits specifically. See the size of her pores, like just how skin naturally has like a texture to it. What we can do in here is just take our grain, take the amount way up so it's like super obvious what we're doing, and just adjust the size so it's roughly about the same size as the pores in the photo. Okay, so in this case, probably around there. Like here's before, here's after, maybe a little bit smaller than that. Somewhere around there. Roughness, again, we can do something kind of similar. Find where it feels good on skin and where it's kind of transparent on the skin. And then from there, you can just adjust the right amount of grain based on like the overall photo. But because we've kind of blended it with the skin, it works a little bit better and it's not gonna look super obvious. So here's before and here's after. It adds like a nice organic feel without it being too much. Whereas if you had like the wrong sized grain, you start losing a lot of texture, a lot of detail, and it just doesn't feel natural and doesn't blend as well. So that would be kind of a little trick you can try. But again, grain is totally stylistic and artistic. So try looking at some photos that you love, 
Import them into Lightroom, zoom way in, and actually see what kind of size grain they're using. See what kind of roughness. The easiest way to do this is just to find other examples that you love, and then try and dissect, like, how did they do this? What were their settings? That'll be the best way. Okay, so we got effects. Lastly, this is the fun, fun, fun tool that nobody understands inside of Lightroom because Lightroom is very, very bad at explaining things. It's camera calibration. Now, initially, camera calibration was meant to be kind of a little bit like white balance, but it's helping your camera interpret color more effectively. So if for whatever reason, your particular camera, the shadows were just like a little bit too magenta in general, well, we can take that and counterbalance it. We can also grab our reds and be like, okay, the reds overall, all the reds in this photo, we kind of want to like bring the saturation down a little bit, adjust our hue up or down. And so you can use this both stylistically and technically to correct things. But most of the time it's going to be used stylistically. And I'll give you like a couple key tips. Oftentimes, if you want that kind of like super popular teal orange look, easiest way to get there is just to take your blue primary down in this direction. So see how the sky totally changed colors and our oranges kind of got more red. That's how you do that. And then in terms of the actual saturation, what you're doing there, I, just play around with the photo, <laughs> see what you're doing and see what works best for you. Um, that would kind of be my, the best advice I could give you with like the 80, 20 rule is don't worry too much about it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Try messing around with it. Oftentimes I find like taking the blue primary a little bit this way feels kind of good. And then your greens, you can play around and see what works best for the photo, but see how the blues get so much more deep and rich as I take it in this direction. And then I can take my saturation down a little bit, take it up. But like, there's just limited com combinations here. And I feel like <laughs> I'm explaining something that I truly don't totally understand. And this is after using Lightroom for years and years and years, just being honest. Like there is no Adobe support for how calibration works. <laughs> I have researched it. And if you do have something, please let me know in the comments below because I would love to expand my understanding of this tool. All I know is that you can definitely use it to enhance your photos and really bring out amazing colors. And at the same time, a lot of times it's just like a matter of trial and error and finding what works with that photo. So I can't give you a recipe here other than blue this way oftentimes looks kind of cool. Try that out. Red is a great place to start with dialing in your skin tone and getting where it needs to be. So go in here. Let me show you, for example, this is a reset photo. Nothing on here. If we just reset this and do nothing except for camera calibration, you'll see what's possible. So if we take our blues this way and we take our reds this way, maybe some more pop into the reds. And you might be asking like, why Ryan, when you take the saturation up and down in the reds, is it adding saturation to everything else? It's because this isn't just like the reds in the photo. It's the actual red pixel value of the entire image. So every single pixel in this photo has a combination. If we could zoom in all the way on one pixel, it's a combination of a certain amount of red, a certain amount of green, and a certain amount of blue. And that's what made that specific pixels color combination. And so when we go in here, we can adjust kind of how Lightroom is interpreting those different pixels and how it represents it. So that's why if we increase the saturation of the red, it's increasing the saturation on the whole image but specifically the red channel of every pixel on the whole image. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so yeah, in this particular case, let's push that there. Now let's play with our greens, probably there. Honestly, I feel like that's pretty good. And then overall, warm it up just like that. Here's before and here's after. That's a raw image. So like, it's incredible what you can do with this panel. Definitely play around because I actually really like that edit. I didn't even have to do anything else. So there you go. So we've now gone through the entire develop module in terms of like the basic edits we can do. So what are the rest of these things? Well, we've got our crop, which we can go in here and adjust just like that. Our <laughs> is the crop overlay. And that is a keyboard shortcut worth remembering, by the way, I use it all the time. But the one that I'm trying to find is O. And if you actually hit O for overlay, it'll show you different crop modes. So now that I've got there, this is actually a very handy one. If you find that oftentimes you want to see your leading lines, you actually want to see what the rule of thirds is or just divide it and find the exact center of the image. Or in this case, it even has a golden ratio if you want to try and follow that. So that's a little handy tool that you can try using. Just remember O for overlay, including different print layouts. So that's kind of cool. I normally just leave it. Rule of thirds is pretty good. Okay, what else can we fix in crop? We can go constraint to image and that's gonna just make sure that if we did have adjustments in the transform tool, there's not gonna be any like weird things showing. It's just gonna tighten in the crop. This little guy here, the Band-Aid, gives us different healing tools. So to fix and correct things. So let's say I didn't want this moon in the photo or more likely there was just like something distracting in the background. I could go and find it and be like, okay, sweet. Let's click on that. Lightroom will think and delete it. 
if it's on the eraser mode. Cool, just like that, we can select the opacity. So if we only want to kind of get rid of it, do it like that. If you want to heal it or stamp clone, kind of like if you're in Photoshop, that's what these two tools are for. I don't want to go too far into depth here because I want to make this simple for you so you can get started editing and get results. But just suffice it to say, if this eraser mode doesn't work for you, the advantage of these two is you can actually select where it is copying from. So with erase mode, let's say I want to erase... I don't know, let's say I want to erase my, my nose <laughs> and I go to eraser. Lightroom's going to think and it'll be like, this is our best guess, Ryan, on what you want to do. And so it's like copied some of my eyebrow and like blended the skin. And it's actually not too bad for a noseless Ryan. I look okay. But let's say we wanted to be more specific. And it's like, I want to put the moon on top of my nose. Great. Hit the stamp tool. Now you're going to see the spot that we just selected, which is here. And then you're going to see the spot that we're actually drawing from and copying over. I feel like this is the weirdest possible example I could have used. But sure, let's let's go Cyclops. That's what we want. We want to add a third eye to this image. <laughs> you heard it here first. So that's what that clone stamp lets you do. It lets you copy from somewhere else on the image. The little brush here, this little healing brush tool, it's going to use the same kind of idea where it's like, this is the spot that we're going to try and draw inspiration from. And based on that, we're going to try and blend it onto this area that you selected, Ryan. Okay. So if you want to be a weirdo and copy a third eye onto yourself or a third set of teeth or whatever, you can do that. So sometimes you need to use this because Lightroom, honestly, pretty bad results. Oftentimes when it's just guessing for itself, it often gets it wrong. So that's some advice there. We can erase that. And the nice part is that you can actually copy and do as many of these adjustments as you want. And it definitely saves using Photoshop. So that's kind of nice. Now, one last little thing that you probably should know here is if you want to do a straight line, let's say that I wanted to get rid of this paddle. That'd be very hard for Lightroom. We probably couldn't pull it off. But if you do want to do a straight line like this paddle, you can actually click once, hold shift, and then click again elsewhere on the image. And it will make a perfectly straight line for you. Not super helpful all the time, but like sometimes you have to actually like copy a section of road in a photo or a landscape. And having that straight line function can be kind of helpful. So that's pretty much the spot removal tool. Red eye correction, you will never use. I have never used it once in all of 10 years and thousands and thousands of photos. So I don't know why it's still there, but it is there. And I'm sure it's pretty easy if you need it. And lastly, we've got our masking tools. Now this is the most exciting creative part of Lightroom. We go through, we add our presets. Let's adjust this again. Grab a base preset. Okay, increase our contrast maybe a little bit. And you can see that in this particular photo, the colors are not loving me. Like they just are not working. So we can adjust our exposure, maybe bring our contrast up. So this is where the calibration would come in handy, right? Because the calibration, when I adjusted it before, looked really, really good. So if I can remember how I actually had it, maybe we can get there again. <laughs> See, I'm happy with that. Now I want to make some individual adjustments, maybe just to this toque. I want to add some texture or I want to make the water have a little bit more clarity or depth to it. That's what these local adjustments are for. Now there's three different kinds that we can do in terms of like what we're manually doing. There's the brush, there's a linear gradient, and there's a radial gradient. And then there are some automatic masks. So Lightroom can say, hey, select an object. Like let's say I want to just select my face. You can paint on there. Lightroom will think and say, oh, is this what you wanted? That's an option. We can also go back in here, select the same tool and go select the sky. Lightroom will just select the sky. Pretty straightforward stuff. I'm not going to walk you through all of this, but I'm going to show you if we want to just select the sky and make it more blue. Easy way, take our temperature down. Maybe add some green in there. And then we can go in, do all the same basic adjustments that we did to our overall image, but now just do it to a specific area. And I'd encourage you when you're doing these edits, the best thing you can do in editing is make small incremental improvements rather than try and do everything with one slider or just a couple of sliders or a couple of effects. If we can take a hundred tiny little changes and make 5% improvements five or a hundred times, <laughs> that's not just a 500% better image. It's actually going to be 5% times 5% times 5%, and we wind up getting these exponential gains, and that's the difference between an amazing edit and an average edit. It's just a whole lot of little things done slightly better versus massive edits that just look really unnatural because we tried to add color to the image, but we did it with one slider, and so it just doesn't work, okay? So let's undo a whole bunch of that, <laughs> and now let's just adjust maybe a little bit more dehaze in this image, something like that. Okay, let's say I want to get more green in the lake, and I actually want the lake to pop. I can go in here, go create new mask, 
because when you click this and you've actually added one mask before, it'll just show up with this mask panel and select exactly what I want to do. So let's go with a color range mask this time. Uh, maybe not, because I'm also wearing blue and the sky is blue, so that won't work very well. Instead, let's just go with a brush. And we can brush just like a painter would, exactly where we want to mask, just like that. You can adjust the settings of your brush with these guys over here. So feather is just how soft the brush is. So now you can see that's a soft brush. And here's a very hard brush. Flow is how fast, kind of if you had ink coming out of this brush, how fast the ink comes out. So right now it's kind of 11% every single time you go over it. And density is just the max that it'll ever get to. So if you had your flow at 100, but your density was 11, the most you'll ever be able to paint is 11% on that area. Whereas if I had it at 100, it'll be 100% right away, okay? So that's how that works. We can go in here and actually do most of this with presets or <laughs> with keyboard shortcuts. So if I use my scroll wheel on my mouse or on my trackpad, just scroll up or scroll down, you can adjust the size. If you hold shift while you do that, you'll adjust the feather of the brush. And that is the most helpful thing that you need to know about brushes. The other one is holding alt or option will toggle between your brush and your eraser. And this is very handy. So let's say I make my brush. It's like, okay, now I need to clean this up. Hold down Alt. Sweet, I can adjust the size just like that. And while I'm holding Alt, if I want a brush or an eraser that is slightly less feathered, hold Shift, scroll up or down, and now we can have a harder line when we're erasing, okay? The last thing you need to know about brushes is this little auto mask function. If I click that on, Lightroom while I'm brushing will kind of try and guess what I'm trying to do and follow the natural lines in the image. So sometimes it does a better job than I could, other times it does a terrible job. <laughs> in general, what I find using most these days is go create a new mask and go select object. Then you can just paint roughly what you wanna select and most of the time, Lightroom will figure it out. Most of the time. And then if you need to, you can go in here and go add, go brush, and we can just like brush on, let's say we wanna add the panel, sorry, the panel, <laughs> the paddle to the selection, we could go like that. And let's go erase, auto mask, sweet, you can see Lightroom's doing an okay job, but not a great job of figuring out what we're trying to do right here. So an easier way would probably be to go add object, paint on top of that paddle, roughly, and let Lightroom figure it out. Okay, now we can make myself a little bit brighter and then darken down the rest of the image by holding shift on our keyboard and then plus and minus keys to adjust the exposure. And just like that, we've really made me pop in this image a little bit more. Now you have to dial things in. If you want to, you can grab this mask and grab the amount and just dial in exactly where it starts to look like as natural and actually was shot that way. So here's before, here's after. We've made some progress. Now if I hit K on my keyboard, that's the shortcut to bring up make a new brush mask. So the easiest way to pull up this panel, just hit K then go to create new mask and select what you want to do. So we'll select the sky. Sweet, let's bring some saturation out of the sky. I feel like it's too blue and kind of weird. And then we'll bring our highlights down. Yes, there we go. Now let's hit K again to make a new brush. This time let's make a radial filter or radial gradient. You can also do this by just hitting Shift M on your keyboard. And let's maybe do one of these. And again, this is what we're talking about with micro changes. So instead of making that other mask super, super bright and unnatural, what we can do is a little bit of brightness in that last mask. And now this one, add just a little bit more, right? Just a subtle little kick. So this area of the image is slightly brighter. And now we've gone from here to here. It's like we have a spotlight on me, but it's not as obvious. It still feels like, yeah, it could have looked this way. You don't see the edit. And that's the goal when you're editing, right? Is that the photo looks amazing, but it doesn't look edited. It doesn't look like someone went really crazy on it. They were cooking in the kitchen. So that's the goal here. Hit K again. We make a graduated filter. So Shift M, if you're remembering keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> Shift M is going to create a radial filter like that. Whereas... I think it's just M <laughs> is gonna create a graduated filter. And you can tell by the fact that I had to think about that, that I don't use this one very often. It's most helpful when it's like you have a straight line and you just want to have some kind of a graduated filter like with the sky. And you just wanna darken down the top of the sky because normally the top is the brightest part, right? So that's what a graduated filter would be for. What else can we do in here? We could select the sky, do a brush, do a color range, do a luminance range, which is just all the areas of a similar brightness. But let's select the water. I think that's kind of important. So I'm gonna go in here and just really roughly paint on top of the lake. 
because I want to add some blue to this lake if possible. And maybe even a little green because I'm feeling crazy. All right. Click, drag. Lightroom did an okay job. It's like, yeah, you want this. And I'm like, you know, that's kind of close, but I just need to add. I'll grab a brush and brush in on the rest of this leg that it didn't select. Okay, close enough for me. And again, you don't have to be super fussy about your brush if you're going more subtle on your edit. And that's one of the other advantages of just doing little changes instead of massive ones. Because if, let's say, I wanted to make this lake really bright, <laughs> that looks terrible no matter what. But then you have to be a lot more fussy about making sure that the mask is exactly perfect versus if you're just making like a small adjustment and it's not so per, it doesn't matter that you maybe the mask bled a little bit onto the canoe. So that's one of the many reasons to do that. So let's reset exactly what I just did. So we're going to add a little bit of blue, add a little bit of green or a lot of green, depending on what feels good. Here's before, here's after. So again, it's subtle. It's not incredibly like mind blown, volcano erupted, but that's kind of the point. Little by little so that it doesn't feel over edited. It just feels like, yeah, this was an amazing moment. The colors actually looked like this and try and think back to like, what is realistic here? And I think that's pretty good. The only thing is if I were to critique anything about this particular edit so far, you could always find something, but I think that the sky in particular should have some more color. The problem is that it's just like a little bit kind of eh. And I want it to be like a sunsetty sort of color. So what we can do here, add some saturation back in and actually just add some purple with this little color panel. So let's just play around with some different colors here. Figure out what feels good. Okay, that's too much, but I've intentionally gone too far. Now I can dial it back somewhere around there. Take the saturation back down a little bit and then Again, it's always the matter of like dialing in, you need the right exposure. So luminance, hue, and saturation. They all have to be right or things are gonna continue to feel weird. So like this feels weird to me because now it's kind of like a lilac, whereas the lake itself is this deep green blue. So we're gonna have to go in here and like reassess <laughs> my initial plan because it just does not feel right. So let's try adding some warmth, capturing that sort of purplish last little bit of dusk and maybe take the purple down a little bit play around, feel out what feels most natural. I'd say somewhere around there. And I still think it's too much color. Probably around there feels good. So we've gone from here to here on this image. I don't need to keep editing it. I'm sure you're sick of seeing my face, but that in a nutshell is how we go through and we edit our images. Now let's just talk, if I were actually taking this as a session, what my workflow would be. If I got home from a shoot, home from this experience and I wanted to edit it. Well, the first thing I'd do after I got my photos in here is I would go and I'd apply a preset to the first image. And I'd be like, okay, so that feels pretty good. Great, next photo, okay. Go in here. Sure, something like that, that feels pretty great. Okay, awesome, reset this one. Adjust my exposure up. You can use the plus or minus keys. Of course, that's blown out, but we're not gonna focus on that too much right now, just getting the white balance right and then apply a preset. Okay, so this one looks better with this preset. Somewhere around there. Okay, cool. So let's say that for the most part, this preset's what I'm finding is working best. I'm gonna select all the photos by hitting Command A on my keyboard and you'll see all these get highlighted. And I can apply the preset just like that and go sync, because remember, those are things that we set photo by photo. And I'll go synchronize. And Lightroom has now added that preset to all these photos. And I know my presets, I know what the look is, so I'm pretty confident this is what I want. Now I'm gonna go through and I'm just gonna edit, and I'll show you kind of real time what I'd be doing. So R key to get to crop. I'm gonna straighten this, and I'm gonna make sure that it's straight according to the actual line of the lake. The horizon should be straight. And then I'm gonna make sure that I expand this out. Probably I don't wanna cut off the canoe, I also don't want to cut off the top of this mountain, but given the choice, we'll try there. Okay, that feels good. Then I'm going to make a radial filter by hitting Shift M on my keyboard. Drag it on top of them. And I'm just adjusting the amount of feather here. And what I like to do, my absolute favorite mask, <laughs> easiest trick ever is just bring the contrast down, highlights up and whites up a little bit. And it's kind of like a portable spotlight that you can apply on anything really quickly and you don't have to worry about masking it perfectly. And by brightening them up, one, my eye is just drawn to them, but two, I can now drop the exposure using shift and then the minus key on my keyboard to just get more pop out of the background. I can also go to my AI engine toolkit and go, okay, let's deepen the background down a little bit. 
Bada bing, bada boom. That looks good. And I can adjust the amount just like that. Okay, now I move on. This one is going to take more work because our background, very blown out, right? So let's start by just recovering our highlights. Maybe bring our blacks up a little bit. Maybe increase the shadows. I'm going to get it like really flat without blowing anything out. That's like my main goal right now. And you're going to see why in a second, because I'm going to go to the tone curve now, and I'm going to add that contrast back in. So you can see my tone curve is sort of taking contrast away. So I'm actually going to add some contrast back in here, just like this. Somewhere around there. Okay. It's looking better. Just like that. And now I really want to bring out the blues in this lake. So how do I do that? Well, the first thing that I could do is create a new mask. K on my keyboard, go create new mask, and then go to color range. Then I can select the color of this lake. And Lightroom showing me this is pretty much we've, what we've selected, Ryan. I can refine it to select more or less of that kind of color. I'm going to select more just so like it's a really broad mask overall. And if we wanted to, we could actually go subtract and go subtract, select sky. Maybe if I don't want to add blue to the sky, I just wanted to add it to the rest of the image. So it'll try and subtract the sky out. Okay. We could also go subtract objects and just paint on these mountains because I don't want to really affect those. That'll clean that up. And subtract, go brush, and the spots that it missed, paint on those. So really, like, once you get your basic preset, it gets your image like 80% of the way there. And then the rest of it is just doing these little things, making the selection. And now this area is obviously missing, so I need to go in here to brush. And I wouldn't do this on every single photo. That's why I'm more choosy about which photos I'm importing, which ones I'm not. Oh, that was a very bad job. <laughs> uh, because this takes a long time, right? So you don't want to do this with 500 photos from a shoot. That's why having a preset that gets you 90% of the way there is very important. And then only editing like the really high impact images is going to save you in the end, both in terms of like running a good business, enjoying what you do, but also in terms of like, realistically, I could never put this kind of attention into every single photo from a shoot if I was editing 500 photos. So I want to really create an experience for my clients and create amazing work. So to do that, I just have to be more choosy. So what I'm doing, bringing my temperature down, bringing my tint down, and that's just going to add more green to the actual lake itself. And of course, take it where you think it looks good, Ryan. I can turn it on and off just to demo what's happening. And then dial it back maybe 50%. Okay. Now, overall, this photo, I think, still could use like a little something, some massaging, maybe a little contrast. It's feeling a little bit cold. I could go in and go shift M, make another radial filter. And I feel like because this area is in the sun, see how that mountain's kind of like green and not just pure yellow? I'm going to add some magenta there to kind of combat that color cast. And then lastly, really the focus of the photo is this couple in the canoe. So what I should do is make sure that that is being drawn to our attention. So I'm going to make them brighter. Contrast down, highlights up a little bit, whites up a little bit. And then I could even go in here and go create new mask. Go object select, paint on them. And Lightroom will do a terrible job. <laughs> so we'll try that again. Command Z on my keyboard, object select. And this time we'll just get a little bit more picky and be like Lightroom. This is what I meant. Much better. Bring the highlights up, whites up a little bit. Maybe a little bit more color there. Okay, here's before, here's after. Now, obviously, now that I see it, the before and after, I've added so much brightness, but I'm also losing some of the depth. So by doing this, I can compare and be like, you know, I actually kind of liked it a little bit more peaceful, a little bit more dusk time. Let's make it a little darker. And at the same time, add one more radial filter on top to make this area just a little bit brighter than the rest. Before, after. I'm happier there. I'm liking that. Okay, moving on. This photo here, very similar story where it's like, okay, first let's get our exposure dialed in. That looks amazing with the preset just as is. A couple of things I want to adjust. This area of the image, a little bit dark. So I could go in here, add some highlights just to that area. And then our subject right here is a little bit dark, so we'll just increase the brightness right on that one section so your eye is drawn to it. And then maybe on the canoe over here, this is kind of like a dark spot. And you can see all these other masks that were pre-existing that I'm now noticing. I guess I didn't properly reset the photos, so that's why that's there. And then our crop, because it doesn't look perfectly straight, I'm just going to adjust it a little bit so that the dot, 
dock itself is straight. That looks awesome. Now, one other thing that we could try is when we're cropping, we can actually go in here and adjust the aspect ratio. So if I unlock the crop, I can go in here and go with like more of a cinematic crop and go like, okay, here's a um, 2.39 to one. This is something that's like you'll associate immediately with like more of a movie style crop. The problem is it's not going to fit what I want it to fit in this photo. So that's not the right crop for this. But maybe if I were to go with like a 16 by 10. Come on. <laughs> when you try and show something and then it just fails. Um, maybe that's more cinematic. Maybe that feels better. In this case, I love having those full mountains. So I want to keep the entire image. But those are some options to try. Okay, here's another one. Reset it all the way this time. Base five. First, we need our exposure dialed in. Next, we need to grab our white balance. It's definitely too cold. Something like that. Okay, now maybe, maybe our next step is just making sure we really bring out this moon. Because I feel like the mountains, they're plenty dark, but the sky is probably too bright. And that's why we're not getting all the texture we could. So we'll go create a new mask and select sky. And remember to bring up this panel, you can hit this button right here, or you can hit K on your keyboard. So I'm gonna go create new mask, select sky. Lightroom thinks for 90,000 years, and then we can go highlights, bring those down. Maybe go into our effects, bring our texture and our clarity up a little bit. Because my goal here is that like the sky would really pop and we're really drawing out the moon. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. So here's before, here's after, much improved. Okay, this one we already went through together, but again, we'll apply that base preset. Maybe bring our exposure down a little bit, which means our shadows and our blacks need to come up. And then I feel like what we had before was kind of cool. So if we actually go into our color mixer, I'm gonna make my blues a little bit more aqua. Bring the saturation down a little bit. And then I think even warm it up because it's kind of sunset. We wanna capture that. Maybe add a little bit more magenta to the shot. Somewhere around there. And then this part of the image is obviously very dark. So we could hit M on our keyboard to make a graduated filter. And we don't want to push this too far. It'll feel really weird. But somewhere around there, I think we can get away with. Here's before and after. That looks great. All right. Yours truly. Now, this is an interesting photo because we've got like such blown out sky in the background. You can see we totally lost all the information on the mountain. So no matter what I do, I'm not going to be able to get that back. So I'm going to probably have to just embrace it and say, the sky, we're not getting back in this photo. So with that in mind, I'm not going to try recovering that so much as just getting this to look really good. So I'm actually going to intentionally be like, yep, that's fine. We'll keep moving. Bring our highlights down a little bit. Shadows down. And then we're going to have to add it's going to be a really interesting edit. Like this is a hard image, which I probably would normally not edit <laughs> to be honest. And the reason is like, sometimes it's just not worth it. Like, is it that good of a photo that is worth you messing around and still being unhappy at the end? Because like, it just wasn't good to begin with. It's like baking a cake with terrible ingredients, right? Like with flour that has dirt in it and an egg that has blood in it. I, I don't know. That's very gross. <laughs> However, you get my point. It's like, Maybe we should just go back to the store and grab the right ingredients rather than like play around with something that's just like destined to fail. So with that in mind, we can keep fooling around. I'll show you a few, couple things I would try. I'd go in here, I'd go create a new mask, select sky. All right, go effects, texture down, clarity down, dehaze down. That's gonna kind of like try and blend all that in together. And I don't care that it's pure white because there's not much information there anyways. Then I can actually grab those whites and bring them down closer to gray so they're not like so jarring to your eye as before and after and now obviously i'm the focus or this person <laughs> the subject is the main focus of the photo but they're also the darkest part of the photo so i need to brighten up this area of the image or your eye is just going to like look everywhere except for where i want you to look so i'm going to brighten that up in a major way i'm going to darken down the entire image overall and then i'm going to cry try and crop out as much of this sky as possible because it's ugly like it's very very distracting so I could maybe get away with like doing that. And then if I wanted to, maybe pretend that there's a lens flare up here. Like the sun is peeking in. And this is a preset that I've got in my preset pack where we actually can add a sun flare just like this and move it around in the sky. So it's kind of like the sun is shining and we got a little bit of a flare going on. Like I still don't love this. So again, it's one of those like no matter how hard I work on this, I know for a fact like it's going to be really, really tough to get this to a place where it's anywhere near going on my portfolio compared to the other stuff that I've got to work with. So I'm going to call it like 
good enough at this point. It is what it is. I could keep trying to mess around with the sky, maybe take my highlights down even more. I could do like a local adjustment there, or I could try and crop it out completely. But it's just kind of like a boring photo, not really an interesting composition. So we'll move on. This is one of my favorites like of all time. I just think it's the best moment captured of, yeah, just an amazing trip, amazing memory. That's what it's all about, right? So the preset looks amazing just as is because we had great light, great framing, great lens, <laughs> and a nice preset. So I don't have to do too much here. There are different things that we could do. Like if we go before and after, I'm kind of blowing out the sky. So let's go K on our keyboard to pull this mask panel up. Plus, select sky. Okay, recover all those highlights. Go to our effects, clarity up, dehaze up. That might take a little bit, get a little bit more detail back. We could drop our overall exposure. And of course, the rest of the background actually looks great at this exposure. I think it looks awesome. The only thing you're missing out on is the subjects, obviously, are very, very dark. So what do we do? Well, let's add my favorite effect ever, nice radio filter. I did that by hitting Shift-M on my keyboard. From here, contrast down, highlights up, whites up. That's too obvious. <laughs> like, you can really see that there's been some brightness applied to that part of the image. So I'm going to have to do this in stages. So we'll dial that back a little bit. Now let's do it again by hitting K on the keyboard, create a new mask. This time we'll go select people, and we'll see if Lightroom will actually find. Nope. <laughs> it says I quit. So we'll go with select object, and we'll just paint on each of us just like that. And if you're wondering how this was taken, there's a tripod on the end of the dock set to like a 20 second timer. And we were all freezing. All right, so that did a good job. Let's take contrast down, highlights up, whites up. In general, when you're brightening something, you'll have better success raising the highlights and the whites. It'll be more natural than if you tried to raise, say, the shadows. That'll look and feel really weird. So you can see the further I pull this, the more obvious the masking is going to become because it's not quite perfect on the edges of the clothing. And that's why doing it in stages, very, very helpful. So if we take just a little bit here, right? We can get away with that and you can't really see the lines of the masking. You actually probably can right in here. <laughs> he said. Okay. So like here's before, here's after. That's great. We're still getting the detail. We can even darken it down a little bit more. There we go. That's like the quintessential friendship moment. I love that. I think it's awesome. If you wanted to, you could maybe like expand the dynamic range a little bit just by going into this tone curve and messing around like a so. Okay. And so that's kind of the workflow, right? Is you apply the preset, you adjust your exposure, you get your white balance right. And from there, then the sky becomes the limit where it's like, okay, I can work efficiently and effectively here. And I'm not wasting time, but I still got to be creative and still got to do all the things that I love to do. I'm just like not getting bogged down in things that I should be able to create systems and processes around. Now this one we've edited four times together, so we're just gonna go with like a black and white look. <laughs> Save some time, okay, cool. The lone black and white photo. This one looks really great straight out of the box. I think it's pretty good. The only thing I do is hit R on my keyboard to crop, make sure that I'm centered here in this photo and then just adjust it so that it's straight up and down. Now, one other thing that maybe would be kind of cool is to go in here and go background deepen because I feel like we could bring out these colors and the texture of the mountain a little bit more. That's definitely too much, but somewhere around there, maybe we could get away with. So before, after, it all depends on what you like. It depends on your style, but this is just mine. And then same thing here. I think this one was actually originally the one we set to auto. So we'll just apply our preset. And if you want to grab these presets, I will leave a link with a discount code below. For a limited time, I'll give you 20% off. You can check them out. All right, background deepen. Perfect. That's maybe a little too far. Go in here. Highlights up. Whites up. Contrast down. Okay. Before, after. Not too much. Pretty basic. And that's a big thing that I think should be said over and over and over again. It's like the strength of your edit is going to come down to how effective you are at just getting it right in camera. Like how good was the lens, <laughs> the lighting, the composition, the actual moment you captured? Because at the end of the day, like it's about the story of the image. It's about all those things that go in 
on the front end before you get it into Lightroom. Lightroom's just like putting the frosting on the cake, right? But the cake is already baked and mixed and poured and structured. Like all that happens in camera. So focus on that too. If you're getting frustrated by your edits, the easiest place to in- improve your editing is to improve what you're doing in camera first. Okay, a couple more edits just to show you what I do. There's nothing magical here. <laughs> it's literally just a matter of like you go through, you apply your preset, and I hate to be the guy who's like, just use a preset. But really, I just want to be like real talk. You can go through and do this by yourself, right? So maybe you hit auto and it's like, that looks okay, but maybe it's a little bit too saturated. I don't really like how far it's pushed the shadows. Come on down into the color mixer. Okay, not too bad, but let's take some saturation out of the oranges. Let's make our greens a little bit more yellow. And then let's desaturate our yellows overall. Okay, right? Like maybe that's what you like to do. And good for you. It's just doing that on every single image, that extra 30 seconds when it comes to 600 images, let's say. Let's go 600 times 30 seconds divided by 60 seconds per image. It's 300 extra minutes of editing. So that's five hours you just bought yourself. Whereas if you use a preset and it saves you that time, why not? So do what works for you. There is no right way. All right. Sure. 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 I think you're getting a good sense of my workflow, my strategy, how Lightroom works overall. Okay. So I was editing this video and I realized I never actually told you how to export the photos once you're done editing them. So let's cover that really quick. So let's say you're in develop module. The easiest way to export your photos is just using the shortcut shift command E that will pull up this export dialogue. You can also do that by going to the grid view and then selecting the photos that you want. Say it's these ones. Great. You can go up to file export or again, shift command E either view. It will pull up this export window from here. You've got all these different settings and honestly, it's really not that complicated. So I export to my desktop usually cause I'm lazy and unorganized. Then later on, I will take those files after they've been exported and put them in the folder of the client who I've exported the project for, but you can do that however you like. I normally put it in a subfolder with the name of the project. So it'd be like YouTube tutorial and then the date maybe. Okay. From there you go file naming. I always rename my files according to the project. I don't just leave the original file number. So I'm going to go with, okay, YouTube tit. Sweet. And then original file number that's in there because if a client comes back to me and says, Hey, this photo right here, can you like adjust the saturation? I don't have to like wonder which one that is and like go through and count them. I have the original file name in there and it's really easy for me to just type that into finder and it pops right up. Okay. Uh, file settings, always exporting in JPEG. That's for me. If you wanted to export with presets, like with all your editing settings and be able to send it to somebody else, you could do DNG, but in general, just go with JPEG quality, set that between 70 and 85, just depending on like where you're using it. Obviously, if you're using it for print export hundred percent, that's great. But if you want it to be efficient, as far as file sizes, even for like client delivery, I will set this around anywhere from 80 to 90, somewhere in there. And that'll keep the files small without losing quality from there. Image sizing, you can resize to fit depending on how you're using the image. So if you're not printing it, you don't need it to be full resolution. You don't need a 5,000 pixel image because most websites, especially on a phone, right? They're viewing in maybe 2K. So you could actually resize it to 2K to 2048 pixels on the long edge. And that just means that if it's a portrait, it'll be 2048 tall. If it's a landscape, it'll be 2048 wide. That's a really efficient way of doing it. It'll save you a lot of space. If you're really wanting to optimize for website performance, I would actually go lower. It'd be more like probably 1500 pixels you could get away with. Or if you're doing print, you would not resize at all. You just take the full size. Okay. Sharpen four, I set to matte paper and amount standard. Why? I don't know. It's just what I've always done. Someone showed me how to do it that way at one point, And that's what I stuck with. So you can play around, see what works for you. But for me, that's just where it is. And it's worked fine for me. So why mess with it? Metadata. If you want, you can include metadata or get rid of it. You can include your copyright only or blah, 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 blah. Like we entered in our original import part. Okay. And if you want to figure out where to edit that, that's up here in your library view. And after all that, you can watermark if you want to. I never do this. And the reason I never do this is because it just honestly doesn't look that professional. Now, if you have a studio that needs to make sure you can give clients proofs without them screenshotting everything, sure, that's an option right there. And yeah, post-processing, you can tell Lightroom what you want to do afterwards. So if you have this selected, that folder will just pop up once things are finished exporting. From there, you hit export. Lightroom's going to think for a little while. You can see its progress status up here in the top left. And after that, 
you're pretty much done. And so this is my go-to setting, whether it's for Instagram or whether it's for print or whatever, because it's just quick and easy. You can actually save that as a preset if you like. So go in here, go add preset and call it my default preset, whatever you want to name it. And voila, you've got a export preset for you. One other quick tip, if I'm like being really lazy and I just need to like text somebody something really quick, easiest way, just open up the file, take a screenshot on a Mac with shift command four, click and drag on top of that photo and voila, you don't have to export anything. You just took a screenshot and now you can grab that on your desktop and send it to whoever you need to send it. So there's a couple ways to export. Hope this kind of brings things to a conclusion. If you do have questions, please leave them in the comments below. I would love to hear them. But the main thing is like, we're an hour and a half in here. And my goal is that you would now have a handle of like, here's how the library works. Here's how I import sessions. Here's how I organize my photos. Here's how I edit my photos. And here's how I apply presets and create a workflow that is efficient for me. If I did that today, then this was a success. And this was a good chance for us to chat, to have a bevy and to kind of connect. So please do me a favor. Would you, in the comments below, let me know what was the most helpful thing here? And again, if this was helpful and valuable to you, feel free to buy some presets to support the channel. Otherwise, like, no big deal. I'm here to help you and to kind of help you create that creative dream faster. Get clients, build your business, do what you love, and get paid to do it. So if you want to talk about that too, you can definitely hit the link to book a call with me and we can do a one-on-one -on -one chat and actually talk about maybe some business coaching and what we can do for you in your business in addition to your edits. Cool? So with all that said, I appreciate you. I love you. I care about you. And that's not weird at all. <laughs> I have no idea how to end this. That's the problem. But we're doing one take. I'm committed. We're doing one take. We're hanging out. And it's just going to have to be weird because that's how life is sometimes. So I'll see you in the next video. In the meantime, create something awesome. Peace.